We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Great, I think that was the intro. So um, I guess we'll be starting. Uh, very well, welcome to this uh, Swiss Open Forum on Digital Self-Determination. who will be moderating the online debate in the chat. Um, today we'll be looking into the concept of digital self-determination and in particular what it will bring to the current discussion on international data governance. Um, three years ago we started in Switzerland uh, to get more interested in the idea of digital self-determination and like all good policy questions it started with a few hard questions. Um, we asked first how can we ensure that more data is being used and reused in Switzerland? How do we make that happen, especially in a context of growing skepticism about why data is being, about the way that data is being used and handled? And then third, how are we handling the problem of increasing data centralization where a few strong actors control key data? And how could this actually start to impact society? We very quickly realized that to solve these questions, neither of the existing answers was sufficient. Strengthening data protection rules or mandating data localization would bring problems with regard to innovation and data flows on one hand. Uh, and not doing other, anything on the other hand would only increase the existing tendencies of skepticism and data concentration. So our answer to this problem was uh, to create an entirely new approach uh, to data, um, what we call digital self-determination. And our vision is that individuals, companies, and society as a whole have more control and access to their data. And during this open forum, you will hear and learn more about this approach. Uh, so my short intro should only be a first scene setter. Some of you may have already noticed that this is already the second time that we do uh, open, an open forum on digital self-determination uh, at the IGF. Um, we were already present at last year's virtual IGF and had a great discussion about it. And this year we would like to focus more on the discussion around international data governance and how digital self-determination could offer food for thought or even solution to the way we approach data governance issues on the global level. And to do so, we have a great panel uh, here, but before I introduce them, um, I would like to remind all of you that we want to have a, a, a session that is as interactive as possible. So use the chat to contribute, ask questions, um, or raise the hand that we can uh, uh, link you in at the later stage. After the first interest statements, we will have uh, ample time for open discussion. And if you would like to say something, just raise your hand or um, indicate it in the chat and we can give you the floor. I will also ask Thomas, who is on site, to be our lookout for questions in Katowice. Um, and I will regularly check back to see whether there are questions there that we might want to, to uh, take on. And now to the panel, I will introduce all of them at the same time before we will hear a short st statement by each one. Uh, we are honored to have with us uh, Gayatri Kandadai. She's a lawyer and has worked extensively on international law and human rights. And today she joins us as Asia Policy Coordinator of the Association of Progressive Communications. Then we have Torbjörn Fredriksson. He is the head of the e-commerce and digital economy branch at the UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD. And amongst other things, his branch is responsible for the digital economy report. We have Nidia Remolina. She's a research associate at the Singapore Management University Center for Data and for AI and Data Governance. Uh, she's an academic specialized on data policy, AI, and fintech applications. Uh, Ambassador Thomas Schneider, who is uh, in Katowice, is the head of international affairs uh, in the Swiss Federal Office of Communication, he, uh, which is Switzerland's ministry and regulator 
in the area of telecommunications and media. And he's one of the initiators of our work on digital self-determination. And then we have, uh, uh, last but not least, Ambassador Roger Dubach, who is the Deputy Director at the Directorate of International Law in, in the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. And together with Thomas, he has uh, initiated the work in Switzerland on digital self-determination. So welcome all. Uh, I'm looking very forward to this discussion. And without further ado, I want to give the floor to Roger for the first intro. Thank you very much, uh, Andreen. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I will also give a very quick intro into um, the idea of digital self-determination. I will focus on the individual component of, of this idea and Thomas will then elaborate on the collective dimension of digital self-determination. So um, as Andrin already said, we started uh, three years ago and the starting point was uh, to realize that the current way of collecting data and use data has two fundamental flaws. Uh, first, as all of you know, data largely remains in silo. So we have to find a way to better use and also reuse uh, data. Uh, the data flow, uh, flows restriction has sometimes good reason as namely data protection, uh, but very often the lack of sharing is motivated also by a lack of awareness about the potential of shared data uses or unfounded fears with regard to potential losses of competitive advantage or that there might be an infringement of intellectual property. The second flaw we have into that it identified is the one I would like to focus on today is the fact that individuals have virtually no control over their data. Over their data. So we try to find a way to turn somehow the users, the individuals which are only users in the digital space, to transform them uh, into drivers uh, that they are finally the drivers of the digital transformation. And so we see on one side that the digital economy allows us to realize, to realize tremendous social and economic benefits through new and innovative services. But on the other side, the way individuals have to act in the digital space might also be a risk to freedom of choice and action. And therefore we believe that um, there, there is a need for more agency of individuals in the digital space. Now, how to counter this? and how to create or how to realize uh, this idea. And especially as Andrin said, how to create a governance framework that allows individuals to maintain their freedom of choice and action. We believe individuals should always have access to data and understand its value as well as the impact it can have on their life for what digital self-determination stands for. Our vision of digital self-determination is to empower individuals um, to become proactive citizens and co-creators of their digital environment. The key to self-determination at the individual level rests on three factors. First, knowledge. Second, freedom of choice. And third, ability to act. This means that individuals should understand what happens to their data. They should also know where the data is. Uh, they should be in a position to have an opinion independently, in an independent opinion on what is going on and what the data, uh, where the data are, able to make decisions and be in control uh, how and by whom this data is used. And this means also that digital services and service providers, providers should enable them to do so by technical means, as well as through transparency and adequate governance mechanism. I would like to illustrate this approach uh, with an example from Switzerland. We are currently in the process of developing an electronic patient record in the area of health. So the electronic patient record is a personal collection of a patient's treatment related documents these might include regular test results, x-rays, 
prescriptions, blood, pres blood pressure measurements, or a hospital discharge report after an operation. By having access to the electronic patient record, healthcare professionals can get important information easily and quickly. The security of correct diagnosis and therapy increases, and also the risk of dangerous wrong decisions decreases. The advantage of this approach is that patients are in full control of their electronic patient record. To open uh, an electronic patient record, the patient's written consent is needed, and they can choose their preferred level of security for every item, ranging from normal access, restricted access, to secured access. They can choose who is able to access their data and get informed when somebody uses their data. In, ad uh, in addition, every access to an electronic patient record is locked automatically for greatest transparency. This means a patient can always control who got access to their data, at what time and for which purpose. Patients can access their log files anytime on their computer or smartphone, whether at home, traveling or abroad. Thus, with the electronic patient record, patients are able to take an active role in the treatment process. So with this illustration, I gave a quick overview of the individual aspects of digital self-determination. And thank you for your attention. I give back to you, Andre. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, I would like now to give the floor to Thomas on site, uh, who will give us uh, a short input on the collective component on digital self-determination. So, hello, can you hear me? Oh, the sound is uh, quite bad. It's, can you say something again, maybe? Say that I like the color of your suit. <laughs> is that understandable? Yeah, it is. It's Let's now see. getting better. You might have to have a bit more distance. Uh, Closer uh, or further away? Is this further better? Away. Much better, much better. Okay, all right, okay. So uh, hello, everybody. Happy to, to uh, be part of this uh, discussion again. Uh, I'll be uh, going right away into, into my points, uh, which are about a little bit more of the, let's say, societal or collective side of, of what happens with regard to, to data spaces. So as you all know, we all know data transforms not just the lives uh, of individuals and companies, it transforms the way societies function as a whole. And in this context of particular relevance is the impact of data on the public sector's ability to provide its basic core services in all areas that we are used today to uh, rely on universal services. In many areas, platforms, platform providers have become an essential feature of our society's infrastructure. And we only realize this when they uh, are not working. So for instance, the recent blackout of Facebook and Instagram and what it did to our ability to communicate and interact is just one example. Another one is uh, also a fact that there is an increasing push of new startups into various sectors that at least in Switzerland and uh, much of Europe used to be core elements of public service which are now fundamentally transformed. So let me give you one quick example in an area, in the area of transportation. You could also give, ex uh, give examples from other areas like health or uh, others. Already today, we see a massive development of mobility as a service. Many of us rely regularly on services like Uber, on uh, services that are uh, low, uh, lending or, or buy, uh, selling electric bikes or e-scooters. And what will likely follow next is the integration of these different services into one single channel, one single platform, and ultimately the integration of these services within or merging with public transportation system. Uh, in fact, Uber has recently released a position paper that is uh, setting out its vision on how it intends to reform and make the uh, public service uh, better in cities, but also in rural areas. In many ways, these developments are good news because they will likely bring innovation an efficient and sustainable use of resources, as well as a better customer experience for many users. However, at the same time, we need to be aware of risks that these developments could have on society and individuals, especially 
if the current trend of lacking public control over private services that have to come to operate part of our infrastructure continues. If we return to our example of mobility, on the one hand, new innovative mobility service providers can extend and expand and personalize and make it more uh, efficient, the offer uh, that we, uh, from which we benefit and close gaps in uh, public transport. On the other hand, there is the danger that these services come to replace existing current services, not just taxi services, but also public transport services. And this, of course, can have a number of consequences, like worse or more expensive connection options for people in underserved areas, or less sustainable service delivery through increase, uh, increased use of uh, individualized modes of transportation. So innovative and improved services, of course, yes, we should uh, uh, use the technology available to innovate and be more efficient and use our resources, our scarce resources better. But this needs to come along with all the necessary precautions to ensure that public interest objectives like sustainability, affordability and accessibility can be guaranteed. So if you ask yourself now, what has all of this to do with data and digital self-determination? The answer is actually fairly simple. Access and use of data are not only the basis for the development of new and innovative services, but in many infrastructures, also the basis to maintain and develop the system. In these instances, data itself becomes part of the infrastructure. And this is another aspect of digital self-determination, that there needs to be some kind of access and control over data that is fundamental for the functioning of socially relevant system. And by control, I do not necessarily mean control of, this, of the state, but control by the people themselves or by the municipality they live in or by whoever uh, is the recipient of the services that people can define and have control over what kind of services they are getting and know that they can decide themselves. And they are not dependent on a third party that the service provides over which they have no control. So what are potential solutions? <clears throat> that are discussed currently in, in, in different inter, uh, international uh, circles. One solution could be regulation of the relevant services and sectors. There's for instance, German professor Christoph Busch, who suggests a platform infrastructure law. Um, this could include elements like universal service obligations for certain providers, data access provisions, private uh, pricing regulations, because as we uh, all know that uh, in many of these areas, there are scaling effects, network effects that render, uh, that give a, a chance or risk that in the end you will have a monopoly, at least locally. Uh, and, and of course, if it's a private monopoly and, and the people depend on it, there should be ways to, to somehow control prices or services and so on as we have it in, in, in our traditional world. Another solution is to develop trustworthy data spaces that allow data sharing in a decentralized way so that when necessary, key data should be labeled as infrastructure and made publicly available so that actually different uh, uh, services can be uh, delivered on the basis of this service so that there is a competition and there's a mutual uh, incentive to innovate and to, over a longer term period, serve the people's needs. We are aware, of course, that this discussion, a lot of it relies on the fact that people's societies are used to have a currently functioning public service or services, be it water treatment or energy uh, delivery or, or public transport or health service that is functioning. There may be areas in the world where these services are functioning less well. And of course, for these, for these areas, new and innovative um, systems are even more promising because it may actually help them to bring to a next level. At the same time, the weaker the current systems are and the governance models of the current systems, the higher the risk is that in, in such areas, they would then depend even more on whoever would be delivering these so-called public or maybe in the future private services. So I'm looking very much forward also to hear from people from different regions on how they see uh, the pros and cons of, of using data and creating data spaces for, for um, yeah keeping our societies working more efficient with the idea of digital self-determination in their minds. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, and then we will go to Nidia, who will talk about SMU's work 
on digital self-determination and especially you've been looking at what digital self-determination looks or could look beyond a European perspective. So Nidia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Andrean, and thanks uh, Roger and Thomas for the introduction and the topic. This very relevant and pressing topic on uh, that, that will affect everyone, every one of us as data subjects in the digital space. Uh, at the SMU Center for AI and Data Governance, we see digital self-determination as an important concept that we need to discuss beyond even policy implications and changes and changes in regulation. Why? Because we are talking about, as Roger mentioned in the beginning, uh, we're talking about how to empower data subjects, but this empowerment goes beyond data protection regimes. So for some, uh, these discussions on an international level could be a, bi a, a bit difficult if we only uh, are subscribed to data protection regimes, because, for example, in Asia, we have a different perspective on privacy, very different one to what, what uh, you have, uh, what um, regulators, policymakers and civil society have in terms of privacy in the European Union. In Asia, privacy is not a constitutional right in all countries. However, it doesn't mean that the development of society and data subject empowerment is not important and is not important to discuss these type of concepts, this type of concepts outside the European Union regime that considers privacy as a human right or something very close to a human right and a constitutional right. We all care about our empowerment, about, about our autonomy and how to determine ourselves in these digital spaces. So the trustworthiness of a digital space, it's a very important concept from a conceptual and theoretical perspective and a soci so societal perspective in all jurisdictions. It is definitely a problem as well as the use of artificial intelligence and its implications around the world for the humanity in general. That's why we are talking about in a policy making debates around the world, regardless of how we conceive legally privacy and personal data, we are all talking about data subject empowerment, data access, and now digital self-determination. So I wanted to highlight this because often we tend to be locked in discussions such as data ownership or what this particular country considers to be personal data or secondary use of data. And we want to bring the discussion to digital self-determination to a point that is beyond a personal data regime uh, in, in a specific jurisdiction. That's one thing. And the other thing is that data subject empowerment from this international perspective, we think should be um, taken beyond data portability and this type of rights that only circumscribe to also personal data. We talk in the SMU Center uh, for AI and Data Governance about digital self-determination beyond personal data. And so we talk about secondary use of data, opinion data, and this information and data that is the outcome of, for example, the implementation of an artificial intelligence model. This definitely affects how an individual is determined themselves in the digital space. So in order to create trustworthy data spaces, we need to talk about the implications of the use of data beyond the personal data regime, beyond the concept of empowerment circumscribed only to consent and the legal, um, the legal uses for data in, in, in legal regimes, in legal regimes for personal data, and talk about information and data in general and how that affects the individual and how the individual determine themselves in the digital space. I will let it uh, discuss beyond these, these points and I wanted to give just this introduction and how we try to conceptualize this 
term digital self-determination at the Center for AI and Data Governance. And we have put together a theoretical framework on this that has been discussed with some of the participants in this discussion, particularly Roger and his team. And their feedback have been, has been really useful for us in the development of what we want to produce in order to incentivize companies, governments, civil society, academics around the world in with regards to what digital self-determination is and how to put this concept into practice in a specific use cases. Um, I will go back to you, Andrin, and I'll be happy to discuss further during our panel. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nidia. Thank you so much for sharing um, some of your research and, and, and what, how you have looked at it at the SMU. This is really, really useful. And I'm sure we'll get back to you with a few questions afterwards. But let me uh, uh, turn to Torbjo now. Um, he uh, has been working with his branch uh, on the Digital Economy Report that has been released a few weeks ago. And he will introduce us to uh, UNCTAD's view on international data governance. Torbjo, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrin, and greetings from Geneva. Uh, let me first uh, thank the Swiss government for inviting me and Anke to speak at this open forum, which is extremely uh, uh, well uh, timed, I think. It's very topical. Uh, we see, of course, the growing importance of data and data flows as a key driver of the digital economy, together with uh, the move towards more platformization, which was stressed also by, by Thomas. Uh, in fact, these two phenomena are closely interlinked. Uh, in our uh, digital economy report that Andrin mentioned, I put a link to it also in the chat for those who are interested. We note that the, the top platforms of the world are becoming increasingly important at all stages of the global data value chain, not only with regard to uh, their role in collecting data, but also in terms of data transmission, data or cloud storage, data analysis, and also data use. So if you look, for instance, at Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, they now operate over half of the world's hyperscale data centers. The same three companies plus Alibaba account for two thirds of all cloud infrastructure revenue. Uh, Alibaba, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Tencent account for 72% of all the world's digital ad revenue. So it's really very high levels of concentration here that is all data linked. These top platforms, uh, as we know, originate mainly from two countries, uh, the US and China. And uh, as much as 90% of the market capitalization value of the world's largest platforms is linked to these two countries. The same two countries also account for 94% of all funding of startups in the artificial intelligence field, which is a stunning uh, number, 94% in these two countries. So, we see a need to explore new ways of governing data and data flows. Uh, how we handle data, we think, will greatly affect uh, our overall ability to achieve the sustainable development goals, all of them. Uh, it will have implications for both economic and non-economic outcomes. Uh, for instance, our ability to harness data can generate huge social value, uh, for example, by enabling the sharing of data for the development of new vaccines more quickly, or in the fight against climate change. It can also generate huge private profits, as we have seen from the performance of the digital platforms. Um, the handling of data is also relevant from various human rights perspectives, including that of privacy, but also for law enforcement and for national security. So it really has so many different dimensions. And at the same time, if badly handled, uh, the use of private data can generate various social harms of the individuals. Ultimately, we think we need to ensure that data can flow securely across borders as freely and necessary as possible, but while ensuring more equal distribution of the benefits from uh, harnessing data within and between countries, as well as uh, allowing countries to address various risks related to, for instance, human rights and national security. Uh, the current landscape when it comes to data governments, governance is really highly fragmented. And the main players in the data-driven digital economy have opted for quite different models of data governance. 
And we don't think that extreme positions on cross-border data flows uh, can uh, be very constructive moving forward. It's very hard to envisage a world with totally free data flows. And it's also highly undesirable to have very strict data localization requirements around the world. So we need to find some middle ground solution that can balance the various concerns and situations of countries in terms of their uh, um, development objectives, but also their levels of digital readiness and, and ability to harness data, which really varies considerably around the world. Uh, and of course, finding a, a, a middle ground solution would be important to avoid further fragmentation of the internet, which we are really uh, heading towards right now, uh, which will not be in the interest of anyone really. Uh, so that is why we are stressing why we should try as much as possible to find ways to go global when it comes to data governance. Uh, we also need to think about ways that can reflect the multiple and interlinked dimensions of data. So I like very much what Nidia was saying here. We need to go beyond just data protection of, of uh, personal data uh, and try to balance the different interests in a way that supports inclusive and sustainable development. This will of course require the full involvement also of those countries that are currently trailing behind in terms of capabilities, uh, in terms of uh, harnessing data. All countries, not just the major players, should have a seat at the table when we discuss how best to uh, govern data at the global level. As of today, we think it's fair to say that no one knows exactly how best to deal with data for development. And I, I really applaud the efforts of of uh, Switzerland here to try to, you know, launch the self-determination uh, concept and try to see how that can be applied. Uh, I think what is much needed today is for us to come together across nations, across disciplines, and even with that, within the UN, we have various as parts of our, our big system that deal with various aspects of data, but we seldom come together to talk about it in a holistic way. And we will need to find uh, future work uh, opportunities across stakeholder groups and look for ways to engage in structured policy dialogues that can help to facilitate sustainable progress in this area. I mean, just as a simple thing as agreeing on definitions and taxonomies to ensure that we're speaking the same language is a very important starting point. Uh, currently, many countries mean different things when they talk about personal data or personally identifiable data. We think that the UN should offer a very appropriate and inclusive platform to advance this multifaceted agenda, but it will be of course essential to ensure that the involvement of all uh, relevant stakeholders is secured in the process. Um, we recognize that this is not going to be easy, but we think it's absolutely necessary. So we really need to bring the brains together and see how best to make progress in this area. So let me stop there for now. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Torbjörn, and thank you for this great call for um, international collaboration. Um, I would now hand over the floor to Gaia, who will um, uh, introduce us uh, to another, or uh, let's take uh, a different take on, on, on why data governance is needed and, and uh, look into uh, other examples that uh, have worked with government or have struggled with governance issues and, and come to uh, a different outcome. Gaia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrin. Um, I guess I would like to sort of add to what uh, my colleagues have said and bring the discussion back to how, as far as digital self-determination goes, the way we look at data is the starting point because oftentimes, be it states or experts or how data is discussed is as if it is separate from ourselves. I would like to sort of bring in the work of Anya Kovacs in relation to this, where she talks about data as an extension of the body. Anya points out that data or data sets aren't and, and cannot be free from biases as our bodies don't exist outside our social context. Therefore, when someone else is in control of our data or is able to do what they please with our data, essentially that is happening to our bodies. There is a clear sort of intertwining between the physical and digital self. So for us to discuss digital self-determination, we need to perhaps 
have be on the same page when it comes to how we look at data not necessarily as a resource or as a thing or as a commodity but actually an extension of the self and i think uh, what nidia talked about feeds into that um but the reality is that we are discussing all of this in the backdrop of an entire industry and significant monopolies that are built around the commodification of data that are fueled entirely by data that's simply the reality in in the context of which we are talking and it is not only the private sector but it is our governments too that hold huge branches of our data especially through biometric id systems health services or other governance systems now if we are going to talk about self determination there are in my view three key concepts that, that have to be uh, central for a human centered and a rights based approach to data and data governance more specifically data digital self determination which are choices ability and control for the users or data subjects as as it depends on what context we are talking about but the current environment with little to no knowledge about what happens with our data how it is used be it in relation to what data is collected or stored how is it processed or who is it shared with and how is the person who the data is shared with how are they using it what happens thereafter these questions remain unresolved and when we couple this with arguments that it is you know not really something users are fully going to be able to understand therefore it's not necessarily something that we need to provide them uh, extensive information about or arguments around the need for low levels of regulation to fuel innovation a few low low levels of control of data to make sure there are innovative uh, development solutions in my opinion are a little problematic because it has larger implications um while the data subject or the user is at the center of the discussions around digital self determination given that i only have 4 minutes so i would rather focus my attention on two significant powerhouses the state and the private sector in our histories of industrial revolution and perhaps in some cases industrial revolution there have been almost all major industries have gone through phases of no control to even regulation that has simply been the trajectory of history now let's look at the pharma industry for instance low levels of regulation or control will obviously favor development of new drugs at a much swifter process, uh, pace uh, but it will be at what cost what would be the risk associated with it and is that really what we are hoping for when it comes to the digital industry and the question is why hasn't those concerns sort of translated to the digital industry perhaps it has to do with what i started off with which is how we look at data perhaps not enough people in power have been affected by the consequences of data being abused now let me quickly move to the governments now governments all around have sort of entered into a data frenzy unfortunately in jurisdictions including india data belonging to over a billion people is collected without necessary infrastructure or regulatory frameworks to ensure its safety we are essentially sort of making up the rules as we go um this has become even more problematic around the pandemic where our health data is collected private information is collected our movement data is collected either through state sponsored apps or other well meaning apps in that sense and that is the same when it comes to apps that are meant for safety of women however little agency is really provided in terms of what happens to our data when will it be deleted another part of the problem is that we believe that data cannot go wrong therefore data sort of becomes a gatekeeper when it comes to government sponsored services or essential services uh, the solution proposed by states is data localization or data sovereignty and there was a question about data sovereignty that came up in the chat as well without really paying much attention to lack of regulatory safeguards or practice around uh, privacy as nidia pointed out now whether we discuss about sovereignty or self determination ultimately we need to ask the question is this going to benefit the people and if you are going to talk about so sovereignty and self determination we need to talk about it as something that belongs to the people as against the state um therefore i would say that newer models that we are thinking about that will enable data, digital self determination for that we need to look back 
as much as we need to look of look for innovative solutions to start with i think we need to find a way to strengthen the un framework on business and human rights to, to significantly be enforced um and 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 if you're still figuring out and, and and i would say that the fact is that we are still figuring out a lot of data about our data and this needs to improve drastically you know we need to be able to force companies to give us more accurate information on how our data is commodified how our data is being marketed and this information is perhaps something that can actually only come from people who are working within these companies and therefore we need data partnerships and mechanisms to get that kind of information next i feel that this this dichotomy between opt in or opt out is sort of an outdated model users need to have more choices not only in kinds of services that we have but or rather we can access but also sort of choices built in services options that that allow us to have greater control of what are the different settings we want but at another level we need to move towards ensuring access to secure infrastructure and devices as something that is not only limited to or out of reach out of reach for states and individuals who are not able to afford it in other words sort of data security data self determination or digital self determination cannot be something that's the privilege of the rich to sort of wrap up my intervention i would say that many states and regional groupings have digitalization strategies what we need is multi stakeholder spaces including the existing ones to take up these issues more seriously bring out more transparency and push for better standards especially on how what is happening with our data i mean i would really just say that perhaps discussing future models when we are discussing future models we mustn't forget existing data of which is of ours that is with different actors which may have well already been compromised but we need to also address that thank you thank you very much gaia uh, really really interesting discussion starting here um before uh, we, will, we will as we are already quite advanced in in time we will move directly to uh, the open discussion and uh, and we already have some uh, some questions in the chat that uh, i would like to address after but first i would like to invite nicolas kurek to take the floor uh, he is this year's Swiss Youth Representative to the United Nations. Uh, Nicola, thank you for being with us. Uh, and um, I'll give you the floor for, for, for your comment and your um, uh, any questions you might have to the panel. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here as one of the three Swiss UN Youth Representatives. Our job is to participate in various international conferences, represent the youth in Switzerland, and then in Switzerland explains to young people how the UN works and how um, international cooperation works. I found it interesting to, to listen to you all uh, using the word data and using it um, in quite an obvious manner as um, those information that are stored on a computer um, in the digital space. A few weeks ago, I was uh, speaking at the opening ceremony of the UN World Data Forum in Bern, um, which was about something totally different. It was mostly about uh, public statistics. And um, I asked people there, what is data? What do they mean with the word data? And um, again, listening to you too, I realized that within the public sector, within government, you have two branches which focus on quite different issues. They are related, but um, roughly two big issues um, using the exact same word to describe it. On the one hand, you have the information that is used by policymakers to make their policies. That is what those statistical offices are doing. And on the other hand, you have all those information stored by computers, um, which you guys are working on. And um, I realize that there are challenges that are different in both both worlds um, but um, which are branded under the same name um, because of, of how language is, is also structured. Um, I figured that might be also an element for you to, to take into account in, in, in your discussions. My question kind of as a, as a reaction to this thought is who do you think are the different actors, the different people um, that 
aren't part of your discussion that you should include. We here in, on the panel only have public sector, national and, um, and international, and academia. Um, who do you think are those other people um, you should also have on your panels? Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Nicola. I, I would point out that we also have uh, Guy as a representative of civil society here. So uh, we have almost all of the of the uh, multi staff of the stakeholder groups, but not entirely all. I agree with that. Um, who wants to react to what Nicola uh, highlighted or mentioned? Any thoughts, Torbjorn? Yes, Torbjorn, please. No, I think uh, the, the comment from uh, is very, very valid. And, and we also, of course, participate in the, in the Road to Burn and the, and the data forum. Uh, all of these uh, are data in a sense, but what is particular different now is the, the immense increase in digital data. That is, uh, I mean, we have seen, I think in 2022, we expect that uh, data flows on the internet will be bigger than all the data on the internet up to 2016 in one year. So this is really still growing exponentially and this is gonna continue to grow as we roll out uh, 5G uh, and as the internet of things becomes more used and as more people come onto the internet, we will just continue to grow. And this is presenting completely different challenges from a governance perspective. Then, I mean, it's not new that we have had data that have been in information flowing across borders, but the magnitude and the implications for all aspects of development are so enormous now that we need to really take a very more ambitious way of addressing this challenge uh, moving forward. And I think in terms of the players that should be involved in this process are all of the above. So we need to have the knowledge and understanding from the scientific community to really understand what is possible to do with data in the digital space without uh, causing more harm than good. Uh, and we also need to have the government side. We need to have the private sector involved. And we have the, ac the academia from all the disciplines, from trade development to human rights aspects to law enforcement and so on in these areas. And I think this is really the huge challenge that we are faced with. Uh, and we are sometimes comparing this with the challenge that we are facing in climate change. Uh, in 1992, when we met the, at the summit in Rio, uh, we brought a lot of different people together. And uh, one of the common identifications was that we didn't know enough to really know exactly where to move forward, how to move forward. So we set up this international panel on climate change. Maybe we need another international panel on data governance that can really bring the various disciplines together. Thank you very much, Torbjörn. Uh, I saw uh, Roger raise the hand and then Thomas. So Roger first and Thomas. Thank you very much. Um, so I, my reaction was just, I had a discussion with some uh, people working in the statistics uh, office uh, recently. And I mean, I think their biggest challenge is to produce real-time statistics. They said that uh, they have to, to adapt in this direction. And I mean, there you enter again our topic somehow, namely, I mean, the, the big platforms um, have the ability with kind of a social media data uh, to come up with statistics, which are much more close to real time statistics. And, and so the question is, who has access to these data and how, what can you do with this data? And so therefore, I think that even statisticians uh, end up by asking a similar question as we are discussing. Uh, right now and uh, I mean I would say it's uh, somehow the old world where you have a very clear legal basis to collect data to produce statistics and then one year after you come up with the statistics for the public but I think um, there, there are real challenges to this model so thank you thank you Roger Thomas well, funny, Roger, I was actually going to say more or less the same thing like you about real time and the word statistics already implies the notion of static, which is probably not not uh, that relevant anymore. So just one one other point um, is that, of course, we, we come from different worlds. The statistic, a big issue in statistics is how to organize data with metadata and uh, how to structure it. Uh, an infrastructure that you actually find the right data and so on and so forth. Whereas 
in fora like this, we probably talk more about the, let's talk about technical issues, but more about the implications of societies on the individuals and so on uh, over the use of data. But I also think that these two discussions will grow, grow together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. We've already fallen the discussion and I have two hands that have, are being raised. I would first give the floor to Amir Mokaberi, who already put some questions in the chat. So maybe Amir, you can uh, already get back to, or you can also highlight the questions that you put in the chat because I was coming to them, but uh, you can ask them now in person, hopefully. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly well. Hello, uh, can I jump in here? Sure, absolutely, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone and uh, distinguished panelists. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, I'm Amir Mokabir from Iranian Academic Community. My question to distinguished representative of Switzerland, Mr. Thomas Schneider, is that uh, what is the relationship between digital safety self-determination and national sovereignty in digital space. And uh, who do you think, and what do you think are the main barriers to achieving digital self-determination? Uh, don't you think that having global legally binding framework like Treaty for Cyberspace could contribute in this regard? Uh, I think that uh, having Treaty uh, can promote trust and ensure that there is no abuse of data uh, in the global level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Amir. I would, um, uh, I think the question was directed to Thomas, but I would be really interested to hear whether, especially on the second point, Gaia and Nidia, you have uh, afterwards a contribution as well on what do you think the main barriers are to achieving digital self-determination, but Thomas, please first. Thank you, and I think these are these are two very good good questions. Um, with regard to digital sovereignty versus self determination, um, the way the discussion is going internationally, under digital sovereignty, people understand rather, let's say, the the autonomy of a country or of a government's infrastructure from influence or or disturbing or, or attacks from a, a third party from another country. And of course, this is, this is one of the preconditions for digital uh, self-determination. If you have no control over your infrastructure, if, if that can be turned down or manipulated, of course, that has effects on your, on your digital self-determination capability as well. So it's like if you have no electricity, there's no need to talk about internet freedom. Uh, it's, it's like a basic condition. Uh, on the, uh, and the digital self-determination concept is rather given that you have an infrastructure uh, that you can use, then how to organize yourself, how to organize a society that your healthcare system works and can use the benefits that, that these technologies allowed without uh, being dependent of a platform, uh, a big international company from another country that tells you what you can do on their platform or not, how to give the control to the people, to the municipalities that they can define themselves, how uh, their local transport system should look like, how the health, education, whatever energy supply system should look like. So these are also complementary or necessitate each other, but it's a little bit, let's say, two, two levels. And about the treaty, um, a treaty would probably be nice and would be good, given the political tensions and the disagreements about where this world should, should go and what roles governments and civil society and private sector should have, I guess, we would not be too successful at this time if we would go for a treaty. Many people have already tried, but so far there's not, at least to me, it doesn't seem to be enough agreement and shared vision that actually they would have a chance to succeed, but we should never give up. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, uh, maybe Nidia uh, or Gaia, yes, please. And, and, and I just want to highlight because we're running quickly out of time. There are um, there is another question on by Ajid on uh, personal data when personal data is no longer personal data uh, and what does that mean for digital self determination? So if you have any thoughts that can be combined combined with the with your response, then that would be really great. Uh, Gaia. 
Yeah, okay. Actually, I think both those questions are very interesting, but I wanted to address this this distinction between sovereignty and self determination, right? Because sovereignty, from my understanding, has more to do with control and non non interference, but self determination is a much broader concept in terms of being able to shape and have sort of agency over your data, right? So I think that I think in that sense they are slightly slightly different but connected uh, concepts but also when it comes to sovereignty oftentimes at least the way it is being currently discussed in terms of data sovereignty it comes from very nationalistic protectionist perspective whereas the digital self determination is about a much more broader culture so that brings me to the question you asked around what is what are the impediments and i in my opinion at least observing from civil society perspective i would say there are many impediments but the two that stand out to me is a lack of culture that respects data at the same level of or importance as people and their rights i think that's sort of the number one problem number two i would say is lack of consequences for abuse of data or for manipulation of data there is really no serious consequences not definitely not in the global south not in the jurisdictions that that i have studied there is very little consequence therefore there is you know there is very little that that might follow from it in terms of in my opinion personal data never really ceases to be personal data because what is sort of what data that emanates from me by mere anon anonymization doesn't stop being personal in my opinion but that that's precisely the issue is that we assume that data just because it doesn't have my name attached to it is somehow different is not a concept that goes down yet with my head but maybe i'm wrong great thank you nidia thanks sandrine just to connect what guy was saying with the last question on this important issue of that uh, circumscribing the discussion to personal data in the context of digital self determination we would like to go beyond this uh this concept of only personal data only talking about personal data and talk about data in general and how it affects the determination of an individual or or a data subject in the digital space i will give an example for example when companies or governments use artificial intelligence to produce other information or other data, depending on the jurisdiction, it would give different names, opinion data in some jurisdictions. This is not considered in most data protection regimes, personal data in some cases. So in that context, if we circumscribe the discussion on digital self-determination to only personal data, we will leave out of this action-oriented solutions in terms of digital self-determination and how it affects the individual, this type of opinion data or, or outcomes of an algorithm. And we don't want to leave that out of the picture because this is affecting the individual in many relevant ways. So for example, in a specific use case in the financial services industry, we are currently exploring these implications that go beyond just asking the person if they want to move their data from one company to another or ensure this data portability type of right and think about the implications of the secondary use of data, of the opinion data and the outcomes of an algorithm, even if this is unprotected or not being discussed from a personal data perspective and in a personal data regime. We want to go beyond that. And that's why I talked about going uh, beyond the uh, regulatory implications or thinking about changing the regulation in a specific jurisdiction. We want to provide an action-oriented type of practice or guidance that will ensure digital self-determination that not necessarily mean that we need to amend data protection regimes for now because data protection is intended to address issues about personal data and digital self-determination goes beyond as the question was implying beyond personal data. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nidia. And I see there's still a hand up, but I'm, I'm really sorry. I don't think we can take that question anymore, but Alan uh, Magesi, if you please write your question in the chat, hopefully we can 
uh, um, get back to you uh, in a written form. Uh, we will still stay here for a few minutes. But to wrap up the session, I really would like to give uh, the floor to each one of you again for a very quick, and I think it has to be a 10 second statement, what you took out of the session today, what needs to be done next, uh, so that we can uh, try to move this into the future. Gaia, I would like to start with you. Well, since it's 10 seconds, I look forward and I'm uh, optimistic for about solutions. And I think we should keep these discussions going. And I really like the idea uh, of connecting this conversation to the climate change um, trajectory. I think, I think it's a very interesting one to explore. Thank you very much. Torbjörn. Yeah, no, I think it was uh, really good. Always too short, uh, but uh, I think uh, one thing to keep in mind also when we talk about data and value is that just having data will not be enough. We need to consider also the capabilities needed to turn the data into the value, a social value or private value. And that's where we are really concerned about the divide that is growing now between countries and within countries. Thank you so much, Torbjörn. Nidia? I would like to highlight that uh, digital self-determination and trustworthy data spaces are also related to sustainability in the sense that if governments, companies, and the society in general don't see this as an opportunity to make things right, we could harm uh, innovation and competitiveness of different jurisdictions. So this should be the view that we need to uh, have when we talk about digital self-determination and how to protect ourselves in these digital spaces. We are talking about how to shape society in the in present and in the future. Thank you so much. I hear we have to end, but maybe if we have 20 more seconds, I'll give the floor quickly to Thomas. Yes, just, just to say that the, the notion of opinion data and secondary data that may be based on aggregates of personal data, but not personal data anymore, I think is an important concept that makes people understand that this is not personal data only, but it's much broader, and, but still then Im impacts the individual. I think that's a very helpful concept. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And last but not least, Roger, for the end, the last 10 seconds go to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, first of all, I was, I, I thought it's, I think it's a very nice discussion we had. Uh, I. I take many uh, things with me. And I mean, the challenge I see is now, until now we try to be very action oriented, as Nidia said, and this is very important. And now the challenge will be how to bring the discussion to a policy level and uh, to the data governance uh, discussion. And so I'm looking forward to for this next step. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for being here for the great discussion. Apologies for to the organizers for overrunning, um, but I think it could have gone on for another half an hour or so. We had much to discuss and this will certainly be continued in some uh, shape or form. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andre, for the moderation. Thank you.